The world makes a lot of promises, writes a Christian recording artist and also a staff member at the Renovare Institute, Carolyn Ahrens. She says, the world makes a lot of promises, smoke and mirrors mostly. Frantic, cartoonish attempts to distract us from the gaping holes in the middle of our souls or to sell us the latest products to fill them. But there's no life in those promises. She would go on to write, a couple of years ago, during a jubilant Easter service, our pastor said something that stopped me in my tracks. The world offers promises full of emptiness, but Easter offers emptiness full of promise. Empty cross, empty tomb, empty grave clothes, all full of promise. The world offers promises full of emptiness, like the empty calories of the peeps that your kids charged up on this morning before they went to Sunday school, and the empty calories full of jelly beans that I'm sure Aubrey will fill them with before she returns them to you this morning. And yes, you do have to pick your kids up today. The world offers promises full of emptiness, but Easter offers emptiness full of promise. St. Peter penned the words that we're going to look at today, and he knew well the empty promises of this world. He and his brother Andrew were running a fishing business in the Galilean city of Capernaum, along with their father, and in the uh, impetuous novelty-seeking, change-seeking style common among the people of Galilee. They dropped everything to follow the newest hot great teacher on the scene, a man from Nazareth named Jesus. In their three years with Jesus, they had heard the most powerful teaching they'd ever heard. They'd seen the most amazing displays of power they'd ever seen. They saw him multiply meager amounts of food until all present were satisfied. And plenty was left over. They'd seen him heal the sick and oppressed time and time again. They'd even seen him show his power over nature by calming storms and storms that that caused them, seasoned fishermen, seasoned sailors, to tremble in fear. And over time, they came to believe that this Jesus they were following just might be the Messiah that they and their people had been waiting for. The one who would raise up a great army and lead them to victory over a long chain of oppressors once and for all. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem with the masses chanting for him had their hearts pumping. Now the time had come. The rebellion would start in Jerusalem and spread over the entire eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Jesus was the Messiah. He was going to lead them to victory over the Romans, and they were going to be part of it. Peter would be one of his generals, for sure. And then the bottom fell out. The rug got pulled out from under them in what seemed like a cruel joke. The rug gets pulled out from under a lot of us, doesn't it? You ever felt like the rug got pulled out from under you? You ever felt like you had things figured out? You knew which direction your life was going? You had the really really big questions answered, the, the questions philosophers call the existential questions, questions like, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Or, or even things like, I know, I know where my life is headed. I know what I'm going to do. I, I know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Life is good. Everything's moving according to a plan. And then he leaves. Or she leaves. Or you're following a speeding ambulance to a hospital. Or you find a pink slip attached to your paycheck. Or you're driving to a section of town you've never been in to pull your child out of the gutter. Or you find the suicide note. 
or you flunk out. And just like that, nothing at all makes sense anymore. The answers you offered yesterday just don't add up today. The promises of this world of safety and security, of hope and a future, of lasting love, of health and wealth and long life, they, they've come up empty. That's how Peter felt. He strode into Jerusalem right behind Jesus, head up, chest out, his direction sure. A week later, he ran hiding, bloodied and beaten with his tail between his legs. The conversation would haunt him for the rest of his life. Even if all these other folks fall away and leave you, Jesus, I never will. You can count on me. I'm here until the better end. If anyone tries to hurt you, I'll step between you and the danger. I'm, I'm your bodyguard. He said, I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus' response to that statement had baffled him. Because Jesus, when he said that, asked him, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I say to you, the rooster won't crow th uh, until you've denied me three times. And Peter thought he proved himself. When they came for Jesus in Gethsemane, when that traitor Judas betrayed him and turned him over to the Jewish authorities, Peter drawn the sword he carried. And he'd drawn blood with it. This was it. This was the moment. The rebellion was starting. But instead of rising up to fight, Jesus knelt down and picked up the bloody stump of the man's ear Peter had just cut off and put it back in place and healed him. Why didn't a man with that kind of power, power obviously befitting the Messiah, why didn't he rise up and fight? Why did he go along with them? Something didn't add up. I mean, Jesus stopped the rebellion before it started. And then things went from bad to worse. He was the only one who declared his loyalty to Jesus above all else. And that night he denied he even knew the man three times. As the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and looked right at him. Peter had failed. He knew it. Jesus knew it. Things would never be the same. Even if Jesus managed to get out of this one alive. And then he'd watched as Jesus was crucified. The one he'd watched heal so many. The one he'd seen speak to a raging sea that became instantly calm. The one who had taught with such power, crucified like a common criminal with criminals. Murderers killed by the very people he'd come to help. Peter didn't have any answers anymore. He only had questions. And the knowledge in his heart that he denied knowing his Lord and his best friend in his darkest hour. The only thing Peter knew now was that he didn't know anything that he had gotten something somewhere very, very wrong. A life that made sense just a few days before didn't have any rhyme or reason to it anymore. He must have felt as bloodied and broken as the body of his friend hanging on that cross. This is the man, Peter, who's responsible for writing the words of hope that we're looking at today. The man who in fear had denied knowing his best friend three times. Who now writing from prison, about to be crucified himself because he wouldn't stop talking about his friend Jesus. <laughs> wrote these words of hope. So what did Peter find in the emptiness of Christ's tomb? 
Let's look together at 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, out obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. As Peter languished in prison, about to be crucified, he refused to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord, and so he has to be crucified hanging upside down. The man who denied even knowing Jesus because he was afraid of what that might mean for him wrote these words of hope to encourage people who were enduring the same persecution he was. He found hope. A living hope. Verses 3 through 5 are one really long Sentence. We break it up in English, in the English Bible, but in the language Peter wrote it in, in biblical Greek, it's one long sentence. Listen to this. As the words pile up on top of one another. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. One long Sentence. Peter may have failed his grammar classes, but he found hope. He describes the amazing, indescribable power, majesty, and beauty of the salvation Christ purchased for us when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. It was the grace that transformed Peter's life. They feel almost like they're tumbling out of his heart faster than his mind can process. Peter's always been known as someone whose mouth worked faster than his brain, and it is here, and it's just flowing out. But it's not coming out as a trickle. It comes gushing out with a power that can't be contained. These, are, there are explo these words are explosive. And there's a reason for that. Because they describe the explosive, life-transforming power of the salvation and renewal that belongs to us because of Jesus. And this salvation is so powerful, so amazing, so beautiful, so dramatic that it can be described as nothing less than a new birth. A second chance at life. Rebirth into a new life. Down in Ann Arbor, Michigan, is one of the most fascinating museums on the planet. It's a facility run by GFK Custom Research, and it goes under the informal name of the Museum of Failed Products. At first, it, it's kind of set up like a supermarket with shelves and aisles, and it looks kind of like a supermarket, except that there's only one of each item. 
And you won't find these items in a real supermarket, at least not anymore, because they're failures. <clears throat> they were pulled from sale after a few weeks or a few months because no one wanted to buy them. It's consumer capitalism's graveyard. It's the only place on the planet will you, where you'll find Clairol's a touch of yogurt shampoo. And you'll find that a few feet from a now empty bottle of Pepsi AM breakfast cola. Born in 1989, died in 1990. It's home to discontinued brands of caffeinated beer, which seem to be making a resurgence, actually. TV dinners branded with the logo of the toothpaste manufacturer Colgate. Anybody want to eat a Colgate branded TV dinner? It doesn't taste like Colgate, but no one wanted to buy it. To, there are Fortune Snookies, a short-lived line of Fortune cookies for dogs who couldn't even read the Fortune in the Fortune cookie. Self-heating soup cans that tended to blow up in customers' faces. Packets of breath mints that they had to pull from the shelves because they looked like tiny packages of crack cocaine. You can find microwavable scrambled eggs, pre-scrambled and sold in one of those cardboard tubes with a pop-up mechanism so that you could eat them in a car. If the museum has a central message, it's that failure isn't a rarity, it's the norm. For every insanely successful product, like the iPhone or the Big Mac, there's a whole lot of ideas that only a mother could truly love. According to some estimates, the failure rate for new products is 90%. Ever felt like one of those products? Not wanted, a mistake, not usable, not lovable. Truth is, in the marketplace and in life, failure happens and it happens a lot. And it happens to all of us. Every single one of us at some point in our lives is going to fall flat on our faces. But the good news gushing out of Peter's heart as, as these words are written is that we don't have to be destined for the loser's shelf in the loser's museum like those failed products. Because Jesus dealt with our sin and our faults and our mistakes through his death on the cross, we can experience a transformation that is described as nothing less than a complete and total rebirth. Peter is describing life in Christ as a whole new life. A life that really is life. And that kind of hope leads to the second thing Peter found in the empty tomb that day. And that's joy. Look at verses 6 through 9. In this you rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved, hurt by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You rejoice. Hope leads to joy. And both are often paired with each other. They're paired together in times of trial and suffering in the Bible. The word rejoice does not mean that we have a continual feeling of happiness or that we deny the reality of the pain and suffering that's happening, happening around us. We don't. We do suffer and we do shed tears and we do feel pain. What joy means, what the word rejoice means is that we can, because of Christ, look forward to the time, no matter how dimly we may see it, when salvation is complete when everything that is broken is made right, when every scar, no matter how deep it is, is finally and permanently healed. 
Peter is not saying just ignore the pain or just get over it or put a smile on your face no matter what happens. What he's saying is, trust me, God is not done writing the story yet. There's another chapter yet to be written. You don't have to like where you are now, but know that death itself does not get to have the final word. And you will not believe the way the story ends. And as a father who's held two sons in his arms as they passed away, I can tell you that those words are true. Look at the phrase, for a little while. Peter is not diminishing the pain and suffering that we all experience in this life. He's not telling us to be happy about it. He's painting a picture that neither his mind nor ours can really comprehend. And that's that this life is not all that there is. The problem for us is that no matter how hard we we try, no matter how hard we, we try to wrap our minds around it, we simply cannot comprehend the concept of eternity, of something that really has no end, because all we know are ends. Physicists tell us that the radius of the known universe, not the whole universe, just the part of it that we know about, is roughly 45 billion light years. That's the radius. From where we are to the edge of what we can see, so from the center point, not really the center, but from our center point to the edge of what we know about, 45 billion light years. In other words, from where you are right now, the universe extends outward at least 45 billion light years in all directions. 90 billion light years from end to end, as far as we know. That means that if we could travel at the speed of light, which we cannot, but if we could, it would take us roughly 45 billion years to travel from Earth to the edge of what we now know is there. It would take billions of years to get from where we are to the edge of what we know, just flying at the speed of light in a straight line. No matter what Star Trek and Star Wars would have you believe about leaping across the universe, even if we could travel at the speed of light, which we cannot, at least not at this point, It would take 45 billion years to get from where we are now to the edge of what we've seen so far. If you imagine the vastness of our universe as eternity, our lives are about the size of a single atom. Peter is saying, I know that the pain and the tragedy and the failure that you're experiencing in this life makes it feel like forever. But trust me when I tell you that it is really just a drop in the bucket. The important thing is not what we can see, our pain, our failure, our struggle, but what we cannot see, at least all the time. And that is the strong arm of our Savior Jesus holding on to us no matter what we face. Even when all we can see is our pain and our hurt and our failure and the tragedy around us that we have to endure, there is something we cannot see. And that is the, same, the saving work of Jesus. Peter says, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you Believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Those strong, confident, hope-filled, joy-filled words written by Peter as he sat in a prison cell under house arrest, chained to a Roman guard, ready to be crucified to endure a horrible death because he wouldn't shut up about Jesus. It's the same Peter who walked away from the cross as internally bloodied and broken as his Lord was externally bloodied and broken. 
What happened to him? What was it that caused this brash braggart who could talk the talk but couldn't walk the walk, who failed memories, uh, miserably, to write these words three decades later? Well, on that first Easter morning, three women who were followers of Jesus went to his tomb to anoint his body with spices. And when they got there, they found an empty cave with the claws that had wrapped the body of Jesus carefully folded and laying where his body had been and an angel sitting next to those cloths. And the angel said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Tell his disciples and Peter. It almost sounds like he doesn't think of Peter as a real disciple of Jesus anymore. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. Peter certainly no longer thought of himself as a disciple of Jesus. He didn't deserve that title. Jesus singles out Peter, though, not because he's excluded from the group of disciples. No, Jesus singles Peter out because he is not excluding Peter. He is including Peter, and he wants Peter to know that he is still one of his disciples. He said, go and tell the disciples. And by the way, make especially sure that you tell Peter, don't leave him out because I'm not leaving him out. Jesus says, I want Peter to know something. I want Peter to know that his denial does not define him. His failure is not final. His story is not over, and the final chapter of his life has not yet been written. Tell Peter that the one he denied with a curse will not deny him. Tell Peter that Jesus is alive, and that changes everything. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Go and tell the disciples. And make sure you tell Peter too. Make sure he knows that even though he didn't claim me, I still claim him. I love it. Because it shows the grace of God in living, breathing form. Make sure Peter knows he still has a place with me. And so Peter finds himself on a beach by the sea, cleaning and eating some fish for breakfast, something he as a fisherman had done thousands of times. But this breakfast is a breakfast with Jesus. And when breakfast was over, the resurrected Christ leans over to Peter and asks him, Peter, do you love me more than these others do? Do you love me more than anything else? Those words must have stung. I mean, what, did Jesus make sure Peter was there just to rub his face in it? Because Peter had claimed to love Jesus more than anyone else. And then he ran with his tail between his legs when the chips were down. Now, as I've often taught, the Greeks have several words for love. And the word Jesus used here was the word for the highest level of love. The kind of love only God is really capable of. It was the kind of love Peter claimed to have for Jesus when he said, even if all these others forsake you, I will not. It's the kind of love we call agape love. But that was before. That was before the betrayal. That was before he denied Jesus. Peter didn't think that he could love his Lord, that loyalty anymore. In fact, he knew he couldn't. No more bragging, no more posturing, no more high and lofty words from Peter. He was a broken man. He had failed miserably and he knew it. And so he answered Jesus. When he answered Jesus, his words were, Lord, yes, I love you. But he used a different word for love. It was the love. It was the word that describes a love between family members. Jesus, you're like a brother to me. 
He refused to use the word agape. He used the word for family love. He no longer claimed to be better than anyone. The look on, a, on the face of his beloved Messiah as he turned toward Peter as he denied knowing Jesus for the third time still haunted him. And so a second time, Jesus asked him, do you love me above all else? Do you love me with unconditional love? Do you love me with God's perfect agape love? And a second time, the broken Peter answered him, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. He wouldn't allow himself to say that other word. Peter was saying, this is all I've got. I messed up, I blew it, I turned my back on you to save my own skin. I'm broken, I know it isn't much. It certainly isn't worthy of you, but this is all I've got. And so Jesus looks at Peter with love a third time. and says, Peter, do you love me like a brother? So Peter, I know you're broken. I know you messed up big time. I know you think you blew it for good, but if you're willing to give me the mess that you've got, that's all I'm asking of you. Jesus met him and said, Peter, the love that you can give me is good enough. Do you love me like a brother? And Peter said, Lord, you know I do. And in that moment, Peter knew that his failure would not define him. That the chapter written on that dark night a few weeks prior was not the end of the story. That he was no longer living in a one strike and you're out kind of world. He had been reborn. And the words he wrote in his letter here in 1 Peter were, were, were Peter's own story. In that moment, Peter experienced for himself the grace Jesus had been talking about for three years that he couldn't wrap his mind around. A grace Peter never ever thought that he would need, but desperately had needed all along. He gave up this world's promises full of emptiness for Easter's emptiness full of promise, and it transformed him. Peter, the brash braggart who was all bark and no bite, who denied knowing his best friend in his darkest hour, who blew it on a public stage for all the world to see, who believed like many of us do that this life is a one strike and you're out kind of life, Peter found out that he too could experience a rebirth, that he would get another at bat. In that empty tomb, he found hope and he found joy. And so can you. Let's pray. Loving God, may we this morning experience the hope and the joy that Easter represents, the new birth, the new life, the restart. I know I need it. We all do. Thank you for your forgiving love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.